I want to start with a brief introduction of Ibrahim. Uh, it's very exciting to have him here with us. Um, and uh, thank you, Ibrahim, for accepting our invitation to give a talk at the CIR talk series. Um, Ibrahim Bagheri is a professor in the Department of Electrical, Computer, and Biomedical Engineering at Ryerson University in Canada. Um, he holds a Canada Research Chair in Social Information Retrieval and an NSERC Industrial Research Chair in Social Media Analysis. Um, he's the recipient of the 2019 NSERC Synergy Awards for Innovation in Industry Academia Collaboration, uh, among many other awards. And uh, he has been the co-chair for NSERC Discovery Grant Evaluation Group in 2021 and 2022. Um, I think without further ado, I'd like to ask if I am to uh, give a talk on gender-related disparities in ad hoc neural rankers. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. You can hear me well, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. Um, the slides I have may be uh, too many, and so I, might, I may run out of time here. So feel free to stop me um, whenever I have to stop. Um, and I'm cognizant of the one hour uh, hard stop here as well. So um, I'd like to shout, have a shout out to my, uh, to my colleagues who, who actually do most of the work that I'm uh, presenting here and are, and are much smarter than, than I am and, and much uh, harder, harder working than, than me. So credit goes uh, to, to them for doing all the work. Uh, so I, I'd like to start, and I think most of us are now cognizant of this, um, this whole concept of diversity within, within AI. There was, a, there was a report in The Guardian in 2019 talking about this um, uh, diversity crisis, as they called it, uh, within AI uh, and how that can perpetuate biases. Um, the report was, you know, although we all know, you know, we've, we've sensed, we've been in classrooms within engineering and computer science, we see that the, the lack of diversity, but, uh, you know, the statistics are quite astonishing. They reported 80% of AI professors being men, 15% uh, of AI researchers, and, and only 10% of them at Google are, are women. There's a huge gender um, um, difference in terms of distribution. They only reported that only 2.5% of Google's work, workforce was black. Facebook and Microsoft were around 4%. And they didn't have any data on other uh, minorities in, in AI field. So it kind of speaks to also the, the things we hear about biases in, in, um, in the, these AI systems. Uh, so the, the human resources that are working on these, pro these, these AI based problems um, themselves have this kind of um, lack of diversity problem themselves. Um, there was this other interesting I found paper that was published in um, last year about the gender gap, uh, gap tracker, which looked at Canadian news uh, sources. And they looked at um, who these news articles um, cited as their sources for, for the news that they were working with. And, and what they found was that um, there were three times more male sources than female sources in the news articles that were published in, within Canadian news outlets. Which again speaks to, um, you know, if, if you think about how biases may be created, think about the sources where the information is coming from and then getting communicated to people. Um, and so if you have three times more men reporting information than you have uh, women, then uh, that, that's actually telling you something about uh, gender biases. Um, so also think about, uh, and I also wanted to talk about this idea of how AI actually blindly tries to, to maximize a certain objective. Um, and I'll talk about more how we, we should be looking at different forms of objective. So if you think about a, an AI system that's trying to just maximize a certain objective function that you give it, it'll end up learning things that may, may be nonsensical, but would make sense from a, a mathematical um, formulation of the problem, trying to maximize some objective function. And I found this really nice um, example where a man asks an AI for his wish, wish 
And the man says, I want to be rich. And then the AI replies, okay, Rich, what's your next wish? Um, so, so what I want to focus on here is think about lack of diversity and biased data in, for instance, the, this, this example of um, uh, three times more men uh, being cited in news articles as sources, and then think about how AI systems have typically not been paying attention um, to diversity and just trying to maximize some certain form of an objective function. So you have, have lack of sensitivity to diversity within the AI systems themselves. And then what you probably get out of it is lack of diversity and more bias out. So this, this concept of, don't wanna call it that, but garbage in, garbage out kind of paradigm. Um, so um, people within the natural language processing field have, uh, uh, as you probably already seen um, in a lot of different venues, started looking at this idea of gender biases uh, within different tasks within natural language processing. Um, so I find this uh, 2019 ACL paper quite interesting where they, they show different examples of, uh, of, uh, of gender bias within NLP tasks. For instance, they mention if you take a machine translation task, input, he's a nurse, she's a doctor, translate it to Hungarian and back, the result then becomes she's a nurse and he's a doctor, kind of affiliating the nurse with a female gender and the doctor with a male gender. Um, or they, they talk about speech recognition where you know, automatic speech uh, detection works better with ma male voices versus um, uh, female voices. They talk about language models where uh, the, the conditional likelihood of generating he is a doctor is much higher than generating she is a doctor and, and so on. So there's some very interesting examples that they show in terms of gender biases within NLP uh, pipelines. Um, there's another very recent um, survey on, on gender biases in, in NLP, which I also like. Um, it goes beyond this, um, this uh, issue of identifying the problem, and it also surveys the papers that, that have focused on trying to come up with some form of a solution uh, to gender biases. Um, they broadly classify methods that address gender bias into these two broad categories of data manipulation and methodological adjustment. And data manipulation being, they try to you know, do something with the data set that the model is being trained on so that the model that is trained on this manipulated data is now less biased. So kind of play around with the, the training data. The other approach, which is the methodological adjustment is how can we change some uh, parts of the training uh, algorithm so that what, what happens at the end is, is less biased. Um, in some of the work that we've done in the lab, and I'll talk about them um, in the talk, we've, we've, uh, we've taken both the data manipulation and as well as the methodological adjustment in, in different works, and I'll, and I'll talk about them. Um, so, so one of this, you know, things that come up is that you know, these biases, they didn't come out of thin air. They, these are things that exist in, in the society. And therefore, um, if you build an AI system based on the data that you have, it would, um, you know, it, it, it has no way of being less biased than what's actually out there. And so these biases that you see out of the algorithms are actually a reflection of, uh, of what's out there. And so, you know, one of, one of the things that people say is maybe it's, it's a better approach to actually try to, um, to correct misperceptions of stereotypical biases within society. And once you fix those, then it gets just trickled down to the algorithms and, and, uh, and so on. Um, but that's a good strategy, but, uh, but also there's this argument that sometimes it's actually easier to fix biased algorithms um, compared to trying to fix biased humans. Um, so if that's the case, then because these algorithms are so widespread now, if, if we can try to address some of these biases at the algorithm sta uh, stage, maybe the effects would actually then trickle down to the humans that are engaged with, with these algorithms. Think about um, a search system or a social network recommender application. If you can kind of reduce the biases in these systems, the, the people who interact with them um, May, may start you know, 
uh, question the underlying stereotypical biases that, that they may, may carry. Um, so, so this idea of if you want to stop algorithmic bias, what you need to do first is to define it, right? So if, if you cannot measure something, you cannot improve it. Uh, so the first step towards trying to um, build or kind of mitigate these biases is to first try to, to see if you can, you can define uh, or capture or measure some of these biases. And what I'll do in, you know, in, a, in a couple of slides is try to look at ways the information retrieval community has engaged with this idea of quantitatively measuring gender bias. Um, as I mentioned, the NLP community has been, you know, a couple of years now engaged, but the, the IR community has, has more recently engaged with this concept of, of uh, gender stereotypes and trying to measure them. So one of the, one of the works um, by Fabrice and, and, uh, and his colleagues, um, a, a recent work, they, they define this concept of genderedness of ranked lists. So think of um, you know, a, a search engine where you have a query and a, and a, a bunch of documents that, re, that are returned. And what you want to do is, is to measure um, whether this ranked list is biased or not. So they, they assume, and I'll, and I'll tell you in a bit um, how they define it, but they assume that there's a function called uh, G of Q, which, which measures uh, the genderedness of a certain document D uh, in the context of a query Q. So let's let's just assume for the, the sake of argument here that we have such a function, uh, and then they define a metric which they call the genderedness of a ranked list, uh, very similar to an NDCG metric, where the rank of the document within uh, within the list is considered uh, and is uh, is uh, is taken into account to discount. Uh, the genderedness of the document. So it's essentially, if you want to think about it, it's the NDCG metric where the relevance of the document at rank D is replaced by the genderedness of document at rank D, D uh, uh, at, at that rank. So that's that's one of the methods. Um, and then there is another paper at CIR 2020 that uh, that introduces the metric of rank bias. Um, and what that is, is they, they calculate the average magnitude of gender within the documents at a certain rank list. So again, let's, let's assume for the sake of argument, we know uh, how to measure the genderedness of a document. What they do is, if you want to calculate the, um, the, gender, uh, the genderedness or the rank bias of a returned list of documents, you would calculate, for instance, how many of those documents, uh, how much of those documents are affiliated with, let's say, the male gender, and then you compute how many of those documents are affiliated with the female gender, and then you subtract those values from each other, and you call that a, uh, a rank bias uh, value. And again, I'll talk about how to compute, how these papers compute um, the magnitude of genderness. Um, and then there's this other, other work that extends rank bias um, by kind of averaging over rank bias at, uh, at, different, uh, at different ranks. So it's, it's basically the rank bias metric averaged over multiple uh, levels of the rank list. So you know, what is the rank bias at, at rank one and then rank one and two and rank one and two and three and so on. And then you average, you average over it. And they call this the average rank bias metric. Um, so there, there's, there's another subsequent work in CIR 2021 that then um, uh, talks about this concept of fairness. These, these other metrics that I, that I defined, they were quantifying uh, bias. Um, so in other words, they were quantifying unfairness. But this paper now defines this concept of fairness within uh, a list of ranked documents. And, and their idea is, um, you know, if... If, if you have a document <clears throat> which consists of insignificant references to gender um, with regards to a non-gendered query, then that, that result set is, uh, is, is, is fair. Um, because you're, as the assumption here, the assumption that the paper makes is that you, if you ask a query um, whose result is expected not to be affiliated with either of the two gender or any type of gender, um, then a fair rank list of documents would be one 
that doesn't reference any of the genders. So that's how they define this metric. And, and the more a, a set of documents are affiliated with a certain gender, then they define this as becoming gradually an unfair ranking of documents. And again, this paper also has this concept of magnitude of genderedness at the document level. Um, so so for, for each of these uh, methods, um, there's this notion uh, that you need to be able to measure the genderedness of each document um, and the way they do it. So they need a function, uh, which they call magnitude or, or bias, uh, that would take a document as input and would tell you how, how gendered that document is. And so how this has been done, the quantification of, uh, of gender, the way it's been done is based on the presence or frequency of gender terms in documents. So essentially, um, they have a list of words that they assume are affiliated with a, cent a certain gender, um, and then they count how many times that word, uh, those words appear in a document, or whether in a Boolean form, whether such words appear in that document or not. So if you have a, have a document that has the word actor in it, it's a, probably a document that's affiliated with the male gender. And then if you have a document that has the word actress in it, it's a document that's uh, affiliated with, with the female gender. So that's how they quantify, quantify bias. Now, so in, in a work that we did, um, the, the first question that we wanted to answer was, um, okay, we're talking about these gender bias measure, measures, and a lot of work is now building on these measures, um, talking about uh, the, the prevalence of gender bias in rankers, and I'll, and I'll show you in a bit. But the first question is, how reliable are these gender bias metrics, right? So, you know, you're, there is, if you have a lot of hypotheses built on certain measures, you will first need to understand whether those measures are reliable or not. So we looked at the consistency of these metrics. So if you have different papers reporting different metrics and using different ways of quantifying things, um, for those findings to be comparable, you, you at least need some form of a consistency between the metrics, or at least have some definition of complementary behavior or some definition of behavior for these metrics. What the metrics currently claim is that if you take this metric and you measure it, it's either a representation of fairness or a representation of, of bias and nothing beyond that. Um, so the first hypothesis that we have is if, if these, um, all of these metrics are actually measuring gender bias, then their behavior, comparable behavior on a set of uh, uh, queries should be uh, comparable, right? So we take um, the, the, the queries that were released by the SIG IR 2020 paper, they had over 1700 uh, uh, queries that they called gender neutral queries. In other words, queries that whose results didn't actually require any documents that were affiliated with a certain gender. Um, and what we did was we, uh, we, we ranked the results for these queries um, based on the, the different metrics. So let's say we take the NFAIR metric, take the ARAB metric, take the, uh, the Boolean version of it and so on. And we ranked them based on, based, based on the degree of fairness that these metrics uh, calculate. So we have we, we re-rank these queries and we create four buckets. Um, so the, the ones in the, the first buckets are those queries that are pretty fair. Um, and then the, the ones that are up here are, are the ones that are showing the highest degree of, of gender bias. Um, and then we compute the overlap between the queries that fall into each of these buckets. And as you can see, the, the queries that fall for, for each pair of these metrics the queries that fall into the first bucket and the fourth bucket have a, a relatively high uh, degree of overlap, meaning they're, they have higher consistencies. But for the, the second and third bucket, it's, it's basically 50%. Um, you have 70, 47%, 50%. So it's, it's around you know, 45 to 60% overlap, which is not that great. So at least half of the queries are not showing consistent uh, consistency between the metrics. So what that so what that tells us is that for the queries that are clearly uh, have a clear cut a representation of gender bias, these metrics agree with each other. But but then when you have these queries that you know uh, um, 
which is about 50% of your queries, which fall in this like middle, um, these metrics are not really able to distinguish them consistently. Some of them, the, the classifications they provide is, is varying. Um, so what we did then was uh, we said, okay, um, let's, let's compute the absolute rank difference between pairs of metrics. Um, so this is, this is all, the, all the queries on the x-axis and the y-axis is the absolute rank difference. Uh, the higher the, the rank difference is, um, the higher the disagreement between the two metrics would be, right? So you see a lot of um, um, uh, inconsistency between the ARIB metric and the NFAIR metrics and then lower degrees of, of, of uh, inconsistency between, between uh, the Boolean version and NFAIR. Uh, so what we generally find is that what these metrics uh, report are not necessarily consistent with each other. So if you have like a paper that reports the results, let's say with the TF uh, uh, ARAB metric, you may not see the same levels of gender bias if you actually compute, uh, use the same method, but compute the results based on the NFAIR metric. So that's something to keep in, to keep in mind uh, going forward. The other thing that we wanted to, to investigate was this concept of sensitivity to the list of uh, predefined gender terms. Uh, as I mentioned, all of these metrics that, you know, rely on the gender terms. Um, so you know, the hypothesis here is that if, if you have a system that works on a, on a bunch of words that are arbitrarily selected, then probably the performance of, of that system is, is dependent on those terms. So what we did was we randomly subsampled um, gender terms from the list of 400 gender terms that are typically used, uh, and then re-measured um, uh, the, the degree of genderedness or gender bias measured by these metrics. Um, we found that ARAB metrics are kind of consistent. Uh, they don't change much. Uh, but the NFAIR metric uh, actually does change uh, quite a bit, uh, actually uh, significantly. And then the other thing we observed, uh, which I think is quite important, is that when you increase the size of your uh, the set of keywords that you use, the range of um, gendered values that you generate actually become quite diverse, whereas the list of um, the, the size of uh, your gendered measurements become quite limited. Um, when your set of uh, terms are, are limited. So again, the results that are reported can really be different uh, depending on the set of the, uh, the, the keywords that you include in your uh, list of gender terms. Um, the other aspect that, that we thought is interesting to look at is do these um, metrics actually correlate with any psychological characteristics? Right? So if you're talking about gender bias, are there any underlying psychological characteristics that are correlated with the metrics that you're looking at? Uh, and so what we did is we measured uh, a Pearson correlation between the value of the gender bias metrics and then also psychological attributes that you can measure with Luke uh, based on the top 10 retrieved documents for each of these, these queries. And so what you see in, in the table here is the top five psychological characteristics that actually correlated the most with each of these metrics. Um, what we find is that the top rank, uh, these metrics are all correlated with the male, male reference. Um, two of the, these metrics, uh, ARIB, uh, they also, the second rank is, is the female reference, but NFER actually doesn't include the female reference in any of the top five uh, characteristics. So in other words, the NFAIR metric is, is primarily itself biased towards the male, male reference. Um, the other thing that, um, that we find is that there is for some reason um, a, a mix up between measurement of gender and focus on time. So if you look at the NFAIR, it's actually taking into account past, present, um, so information about, uh, about time, the other metrics as well, so past, present. So this type of information is taken into account um, to account for genderedness of a document, which, uh, which doesn't make uh, too much sense. So, so basically, uh, you know, what, what we find is that we have to be really careful 
with how we, uh, we interpret these gender bias measures. Uh, as, as people are actually now reporting more and more how uh, different methods are, are biased towards different genders, it's really important to kind of systematically understand what these, these metrics are reporting. Um, they may not actually be correlated with what you, you're trying to measure. Uh, and, and, and more so, they may not even be uh, uh, correlated with each other. So if you report a metric, you report a different metric, those, those may not even be uh, consistent in terms of performance. Um, I just want to make uh, a couple of notes on those. Something that, um, that people haven't been paying attention to um, is this treatment of gender bias and how a term-based treatment of bias actually impacts measurements. For instance, take these two uh, ty uh, titles uh, into account. The first one says, female CEO says women shouldn't be president because of different hormones. Um, the second one says the, pr the next president should not be a man, right? So if you take the current metrics that you have for gender bias, uh, the, the metrics would say the first one is favoring females, the second one is favoring males. Whereas if you look at the semantics of these two documents, although the term frequency of female terms is much higher in the first one, the, the concept, the stance towards the topic is actually uh, uh, anti-female and, and, the, and the next one is, 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 is different. So one of the major issues with these uh, uh, gender bias metrics is they would just take term frequency counts into account for measuring, measuring bias. Um, the other note uh, I want to have is, um, and, and it's, it's, I think it's a threat to also the, the type of work that I'm going to present also today, is this, um, is this notion of gender binarism. And if you look at the data sets that are available now in, in the literature, they primarily assume that there are two genders, the male and the female, and, um, and then they also have this other uh, uh, category called the neutral or um, genderless uh, queries, and that's about it. There's one paper that talks about other or multiple types of genders, but it on only includes about 41 queries that are really not very helpful um, to do any type of analysis. So I think there's, there's also something to think about here um, if we're talking about gender biases, um, you know, as we engage with research on, on, on gender within information retrieval to also kind of not be biased towards a, a binary representation of gender as well. So what I want to talk about in this remainder of, uh, of my talk is, is, you know, stereotypical biases in relevance judgments and, and retrieval methods. Um, so th this is, I think, Navid's paper was one of those papers that actually brought some light to this idea of, uh, of neural ranking models kind of intensifying gender bias. They took um, these gender bias metrics, uh, ran, um, trained um, uh, some neural rankers, as you can see listed here, KNRM, Match Pyramid, and so on. Uh, and they showed that uh, neural rankers, when you measure um, the degree of bias in these neural rankers, that um, the degree of bias in them is, is quite high. And they concluded that if you, if you uh, train neural ranking models, that these compared, let's say, to a BM25 model, which is this black and red column, their degrees of bias is, is consistently higher. And so they concluded that these neural ranking models do intensify gender bias. So if we take that as, um, a, as a starting point, the first question to ask is where where is this gender bias coming from? Um, so, so let's look at some, so one, one area that this could be coming from is the training data, right? So relevant judgments for, let's, let's suppose we're looking at the MS Marco relevant judgment documents. Uh, for instance, the first query, how important is a governor? Um, the, the document that's labeled as relevant is one that always talks about governor with a he pronoun. So it just assumes that a governor is a he. Um, whereas, you know, constitutionally, it can be any gender. So, so that's one observation, right? Uh, 
Uh, for instance, take another query from MS Marco, which talks about US president. Again, the relevant document that's labeled for this query, again, assumes that the president can only be a he. Um, another example is, is a query that's not even related to a person. It's just talking about how much to rent a room in a house. Uh, but then the re relevant document assumes that the person who wants to, to rent and pay the rent is a male uh, character who's paying the rent. So, um, so there's, you know, if you look at the relevant judgment documents, there are some signs of, uh, of gender affiliation, even for queries that um, are not gendered. So what we wanted to set out to do is to kind of systematically look at whether uh, relevant judgment uh, data sets, specifically MS Marco, which is used now widely for training neural anchors, actually include some of these gender biases. Um, so what, what we need to do is to compare documents that are retrieved for, for queries from different genders, gender affiliations, and then compare them. Um, a fair situation is, is where the documents from queries uh, affiliated with any gender would have comparable characteristics, right? Um, so, so the problem we had was that uh, there's 500,000 queries and we needed to, to identify uh, the query, uh, the gender affiliation of these queries. So what we did, and it's pretty much impossible to do that manually. So what we did was we took the queries that was, were released in the CIGIR 2020 paper as, uh, as, a, as a baseline. So they had about 1,200 male queries and 700 female queries. And we fine-tuned a, a BERT model to take um, queries as input and label them uh, with, uh, with three classes of, of gender. Again, I'd note that you know, this is a limited interpretation of gender and, and it's an issue that we need to resolve. Um, and so we have a model that's, you know, uh, has a over 80% F1 score for, for labeling queries. So we assume that we can use this um, a classifier to take um, the, the queries with at least one relevant judgment document in MS Marco's development set, the dev set. Um, and we label them and we end up with 1400 female queries and around 2000 male queries. And some of those, for instance, is, you know, can you take naproxen during pregnancy, Amy Osborne net worth, you know, these two are affiliated with female, uh, foods that can prevent prostate cancer affiliated with male, uh, and so on. So these are the labels that we generate. So now we have a data set that has female and male queries um, from MS Marco, automatically labeled. Um, and then we, so what we do is we then uh, compute um, look characteristics, which are these psychological characteristics based on the documents affiliated with, uh, with the queries. Um, because this is relevant judgment documents, you know which document is actually relevant to a certain query, so you can compare them. Um, so just to make sure that the, this computation is reliable, um, Luke allows us to, to measure the gender of a certain document. So for the queries that were labeled as female, um, around 80% of the time, Luke found the, the relevant document to also be a female. And also for male queries, um, around 75% of the time, Luke found the relevant document to also be affiliated with male. So the measurements with Luke are, are um, rather reliable. So what we found is uh, looking at effective processes, we find that uh, there are similar degree of positive emotions regardless of the gender. So female and male documents affiliated with um, those two genders show comparable um, uh, results. But what we find is in terms of negative emotions, for instance, documents affiliated with uh, female documents are, are more negative, showing more negative emotions. In terms of anxiety and sadness, you know, significantly higher in fem female queries. In terms of anger, significantly higher in, in male documents. Um, looking at cognitive abilities, um, it shows the documents affiliated with female queries show higher levels of cognitive uh, abilities for females consistently. Um, in terms of personal concerns, again, consistently showing higher degrees of, of, of personal focus for male queries, for instance, you know, compare leisure, it's significantly higher compared to female queries. Think about 
you know, concept of death, there's significantly higher um, uh, association between uh, male queries than there is between the female. Uh, money and so on. So, so what we observe is basically, if you think about the, uh, the relevant judgment documents and how they're affiliated with different genders, um, you can actually observe uh, noticeable differences on how documents are affiliated with, with different um, uh, gender types. So what we set out doing is that if, if you have a, a relevance judgment data set like MS Marco, can you actually debias this so that uh, your the neural models that you train on it become fair, right? So it's pretty much impossible to actually manually debias it. So what we wanted to do is, is to kind of come up with this automated way of debiasing um, MS Marco. So the idea is that if you, if you have, you know, if, if you're starting off building a new data set for relevance judgments, that you would say, okay, I, I want to be really cognizant of gender. So now I, I want to create this balanced set of query document pairs where the ones affiliated with a certain gender would have an associated pair with the other gender where the levels of psychological characteristics or level of bias are comparable. So that certain types of gender, uh, stereotypical gender biases don't get associated with a certain gender um, in the model. So that's, that's the idea. If, if, you, if you went about it that way, that's how you build your data set, right? Um, but so what we did was, you know, a balanced, uh, a balanced data set would be, you know, if you assume again, a, a binary gender construct, you would have a male query and a female query that are comparable. And then the documents that are associated with them are also uh, exhibiting similar types of psychological characteristics. So, um, so given we can't do that, we set out to kind of automatically balance MS Marco. And the way we do this is we say, okay, you have a whole bunch of documents within your MS Marco collection passages. You can take something like a doc T5 query or doc to query, which learns to generate queries for documents. And this way you can, you can take that model and generate queries, right? So, so that's what we did. We generated for the, for, for the documents in MS Marco, we created queries. And then we took those queries and we labeled them with gender. So the queries that we generate, um, we, we estimate their gender. And because these queries were generated from a certain document, we know what relevant document um, is, what is the relevant document for that query. So we now have this set of queries for which the query was generated, there's a relevant document for that query, and we also know the, gen the gender of the query, right? So we now, um, so for the relevant documents associated with each generated query, we calculate the psychological characteristics of those documents based on look, and, and so it, it generates for us a vector representation of psychological characteristics for these documents. And so what we do is we kind of, uh, find for each, say, male query, if you find an exactly matching female query, which has similar psychological characteristics. So we kind of create these pairs of, of matching queries. And so we add, so we have this whole bunch of uh, uh, paired uh, query documents. And so we add them gradually to the MS Marco training set. So here, if you look at this table, you know, this, this first row, this first row is the original, uh, a neural model actually trained on, on the original data set. And then this one is where you have an additional 5% of data from our data sets, from our pairs, and then 15%, and then 25%, and then 35%. And so as you start to gradually add these new pairs of query documents to your data set, you know, performance in terms of MRR stops to drop because the, the queries that we generate, although are trained based on MS Marco, but still they're kind of um, synthetic query document pairs um, and that impacts your performance, obviously. So what we did was we added queries, query document pairs, synthetic query document pairs to the training set 
until which point the, the performance on MRRs dropped uh, uh, within a statistically significant range, right? So if you add about 25% new data to MS Marco based on the way we do it, you get about 2.5% drop in MRR, but that 2.5% is not statistically significant. So that's, that we find that is the tolerable amount to add data. And then what we see is that if you go back now to the neural ranker that, that's trained and now try to measure these uh, psychological characteristics, you would see although the performance on MRR hasn't dropped significantly, but the reduction in these gender uh, affiliations has dropped significantly. So you get the difference between male and female affiliation on affective processes, for instance, which is anger and negative sentiments and so on, the difference drops by about 36%. So the, the models that you, that you get out of your training model is, is now less sensitive to, to your gender. You can also see a similar thing based on the, the, the ARIB and, uh, uh, metrics. Uh, you would see that on different sets of queries, you would see somewhere between 5% you know, to 35% reduction in, in observable gender, um, gender biases. So you can actually build so you can actually build these automatically query document pairs um, that have similar degrees of, uh, of psychological characteristics and you systematically add them to the relevant judgment data set. And you, when you train your model, the performance doesn't degrade, but at the end of the day, the, your measurements of gender bias is actually uh, reduced. Now, so, so we, we, we looked at the relevant judgments, but if you, if you think about a methodological approach, um, can you actually change your neural ranker model a little bit and kind of make it a bit fairer? So what we did was we said, okay, most of these algorithms are actually optimizing for relevance. They're not optimizing for fairness. Um, and then the assumption from Navid's paper was that these neural rankers intensify these gender biases. So we actually want a fair ranker that maintains the same level of retrieval effectiveness because that's what we do in information retrieval. But at the same time, we minimize uh, these gender biases. So if you look at the a loss function of a, of a typical max margin or hinge loss, um, it's just trying to do two things. It's trying to maximize the relevance of relevant documents to the query and at the same time, minimize um, the relevance to irrelevant documents, right? So it's, it's just very simple loss function. So if you want to introduce a term in here that considers biases, you would say, okay, I have a relevant document DI to the query. I'm interested in those relevant documents that are relevant to Q and have the lowest amount of uh, gender bias. Uh, so the preference is if you have options to choose from, um, if I have, if I'm asking about President of the United States and I have 10 options, I would prefer the one that is talking in a gender neutral tone about the President of the United States to be placed at the top rank. So you would actually, imp, you know, take the gender bias uh, incorporated into your uh, relevance function. And the similar way, if you have an irrelevant document, uh, think about 10 different irrelevant documents. The, the irrelevant document that's least desired is the one that's irrelevant and at the same time has the highest degrees of, of gender bias. So we incorporate these two. Uh, the catch here is that for, um, for MS Marco type uh, relevant judgments, there's typically only um, one relevant judgment per, per query. So it's very sparse. Uh, and if, if you end up trying to um, kind of negatively impact the relevant document, your model would actually not learn the concept of relevance because your model, your relevant judgment set already has only one relevant document and that relevant document may be biased. So you're just negatively impacting the concept of relevance. So what we end up proposing is that although we have just one relevant document, but we have a whole bunch of irrelevant documents that you could take from negative sampling. And so we want, to allow the model to learn the concept of gender bias through negative samples. So we only impact the gender bias on, on the term um, that's measuring irrelevance, if you will. Oops, sorry. So if you look at how this works, 
Um, there's a 2021 paper that introduced an, uh, an adversarial uh, training model for BERT uh, that separately learns a concept of gender and uh, gender bias and relevance. It's called ADVBERT, if you, uh, uh, which is a, you know, a heavy model compared to our model where we only introduce a term in the loss function. Um, if you compare in terms of MRR difference after changing the bias, the, the loss function, um, the advert model actually decreases MRR significantly. Um, for instance, on BERT mini, it reduces somewhere close to 20% on MRR at cutoff 10. And at cutoff 20, it's about 25% on MRR. So the, the, for, for the model to actually make um, retrieval fair, it has to hit um, MRR significantly performance. But our model is on, on BERT mini is not as bad as about 5% decrease or 6% decrease on MRR. And in fact, on BERT tiny, we actually show perf performance improvement. Um, but the more important part here, which is our focus, is looking at uh, reduction in bias. So um, on BERT tiny, we don't show as high of a reduction in gender bias compared to at BERT, but think about it this way. This is a trade-off between retrieval effectiveness and bias. So we do, in fact, for instance, here, reduce bias by about 28%. Um, and at the same time, if you think about it here, we only reduce MRR by about 5% compared to 20% hit. So if you think about that trade-off, it's, you know, you want your model to still be an effective IR system. Um, so which is, which is pretty good. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to jump over this work here um, in favor of, the next one. Okay, so, so what we've done is, is talk about gender biases in, um, in, uh, in, in measuring these gender biases based on some metric. Uh, but the other aspect of this um, gender topic is basically forget about metrics of bias, just think about performance. Um, and the, the, the question is, if you have a neural ranker, regardless of how it performs in terms of gender bias. The expectation is that the retrieval effectiveness of your neural ranker should be the same regardless of the gender of the query, right? So if you, if you submit a, gen, uh, a, a male query, gives you a certain uh, per retrieval performance effectiveness, you submit a female query, you expect the, the performance not to be impacted by the gender, right? So, so it, it, we study uh, gender related performance disparities, right? Um, again, the expectation is that if you have a fair neural ranker uh, for two sets of queries, which is let's say female queries and, and male queries, that the performance, the retrieval effectiveness should be comparable. Say, you know, you can be mean average precision. Um, you would only have a gender related retrieval effectiveness disparity if you have two sets of comparable queries which differ just based on gender but the performance of the retrieval model is statistically significant, uh, significantly different between the two sets. So we wanted to explore this. And what we did is we took you know, two models, BERT tiny and, and mini LM, and female queries and, and male queries, and measured uh, MRR at 10 on these queries. And you can see that um, depending on the model, but at least 15% lower MRR on female queries versus uh, male queries. So the perform the the actual ret ret retrieval effectiveness is much lower on female queries uh, compared to male queries. And so the, the the question to ask is what is the source of this disparity, right? So if you think about neural rankers and how they perform, is that they actually learn association between the query and the relevant document. Right. So if that's what is happening, um, one assumption that we can make is that it may be easier for uh, the neural ranker to actually learn associations between male queries and their relevant documents compared to female queries and their relevant documents. Um, so then you might ask, how is that possible? Um, and the way that is possible, that could be possible, and I'm going to show you is that 
within the relevant judgment data set, the documents that are considered to be relevant for mail queries are more clearly associated with that with a query compared to the doc documents relevant for the female query. And so when the association between the query and the relevant document is much clearer, the neural linker has a easier uh, uh, job of finding them. So what we did is we said, okay, if that's the case, let's learn a function between Q and D, uh, uh, sorry, not learn, uh, measure a deterministic function, something like BM25, and calculate the similarity between the query and, and the documents. Um, the expectation is that the distribution of, let's say, a BM25 on the relevance judgment data set between the query and the relevant document should be the same for female queries and, and male queries, right? So what we did is what we, we plotted this distribution. Um, this is the BM25 scores and these are the queries. Um, the, the cream yellow ones are male queries and the blue ones are, are the female queries. And what you can actually see is that for the female queries, the BM25 score relevance of the female query to their relevance documents are pretty low. So you can see a lot of like um, 50, 60 queries here, much more than the male queries. So they are immediately less clearly aff affiliated with their relevant uh, uh, document. And on the other hand, the relevant documents that are affiliated with the male queries uh, and have a high BM25 score are much more compared to the female queries, right? So there's a, there's a visible uh, uh, difference between the distribution of the BM25 scores on the relevant judgment uh, collection. So what we set out to do is to say, okay, if you want to solve this problem, again, similar to the strategy that we had before, is can you actually be, uh, create a, a, an automatic technique which would fill, it, fill up this gap, right? And if the, if the source of disparity is this difference in the distribution, if you fill up gap, these gaps with queries and documents that are, that are relevant uh, and are from the either gender, then you should be able to, to see an improvement in, in the performance and comparable performance in your models. So we, we kind of set out to fill up these gaps aut automatically. One way we did it is we randomly sampled queries um, from uh, queries from um, the, the male and the female, so that at the end, they have a similar distribution. A se second strategy that we adopted was again to use something like a doc T5 query to generate queries uh, affiliated with female queries that have similar BM25 to those of the males and we kind of fill up these, these gaps. And what you see here is the, is the fill up version. Um, it's not completely overlapping because we weren't able to kind of make them completely overlapping, but they're much better than the original distribution. And so we then trained neural rankers based on the original relevant judgment and then also based on the two strategies we had for, for the other two. And so if you look at the scenario where you had the unbalanced data set, this is the performance of the female queries and these are the performance of the male queries. Um, the, the one that we started to kind of sample, down sample, um, has a bit better. So it's actually showing a better performance on the female queries. You know, it was here, it's actually improving. Um, and on some other, uh, like mini LM, you actually show that it's, they're becoming comparable. And on Distil Roberto, for instance, they can, you know, become completely comparable. Um, on the one that we generate queries, the nice observation is that the average performance of the system actually is comparable to the original model. So if you take the average of this performance of these two sets of queries and take the average of these two, the MRR, average MRR performance of the whole system over all queries is not dropping, but the, the gap between um, the performance disparities is actually reducing. So you can actually get a model that has a similar performance on different types of gender queries uh, and overall, it's maintaining the same level of retrieval effectiveness. So uh, I'm going to end um, by saying, you know, the bad news is that there are stereotypical biases and they may be intensified at scale. It's, it's hard to say for sure because the metrics that we're using are, um, are kind of biased towards our definition of a gender, 
and they're kind of biased towards a set of keywords that we use. And they're also biased to this notion of, of a binary gender, but taking all those, you know, keeping the, all of those things in mind with our limited definition of a gender bias, you can actually see that that measurement of bias actually leads to intensification uh, when you use neural anchors. Um, so, so some of the reasons for this could be the way relevant judgment documents were collected. They were inherently, maybe not even intentionally, um, collected in a way that they are biased towards a certain gender. And then you have these neural anchors that only optimize for relevance. They don't optimize for, uh, for fairness. Uh, the good news is that in some of the work that we've done and other people have done also, is that you can actually come up with strategies, even not very heavy strategies, um, quite, quite lightweight strategies to, to debias relevant judgment collections, um, to change you know, loss functions within neural rankers and so on, um, to kind of reduce the degrees of gender bias without uh, sacrificing uh, retrieval effectiveness. So uh, thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go over my time too much. Great, thank you. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Please join me with a round of applause. Um, okay, um, we might have time for one question. Any question from the online audience or people here? James? So thanks for the nice talk, uh, raising a lot of interesting issues. It seems like one of the things you showed when you were looking at the uh, uh, changing the loss function, um, the stuff that led to that was that if you if you make if you focus on making everything fair uh, or gender neutral, let's say in some fashion, whatever that means, you end up losing relevant documents. Um, the implication being that the that there's a lot of relevant documents that are, I believe in this case, male focused. Um, does that in some ways mean we're kind of doomed um, because you're, you're stuck with a collection that you're searching that's gen heavily biased in gender. And if somebody's searching it, you have this, they probably want the relevant stuff even if it is gendered uh, mm -hmm. or imbalanced or something. I mean, is that, so does this mean it's really, there's also a very large social issue that's uh, sort of separate from the learned systems that we have here. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, and it's like a it's like a catch twenty two, right? And so, how you know is it when you're if you're a, if you're a user of a of a search engine, do you prefer um, to have a less relevant document, which is fair? but a highly or, or a highly relevant document that may contain stereotypical biases, right? And the answer to that question might really depend on the use case as well, right? And maybe even on the type of query that you're searching for. Um, maybe whether that the, the result of that query is it really sensitive to a certain societal decision that you're making, or is it maybe just a technical, maybe math-related question, and you don't really care about the gender in that context, or it, you know, there's a lot of things to take into account, right? Um, but but the going back to the loss function um, idea there is that because you a lot of gender biases are there in the relevant documents, and you and the relevant documents are quite sparse, just because you don't you know because you don't want to sacrifice retrieval effectiveness, um, you can't really negatively penalize those relevant documents. But at the same time, when you're doing negative sampling, you, you want to be cognizant, uh, cognizant of bias in those irrelevant documents, right? So, so your neural ranker could learn a concept of gender bias by looking at your irrelevant documents. So you'd say, you know, this is a document that's irrelevant and it's even worse than this other irrelevant document because there is some notion of gender bias in that document. So the hope is that you're, although the model is not learning relevance 
based on your 11 documents, but it's learning what types of content it should really, really be, be avoiding. So that's the hope. So when you kind of negatively sample and you negatively impact the biased negative samples that the model kind of starts to learn, okay, this is irrelevant. And this other one is really, really irrelevant because it has, it has these terms or these phrases in it that are somewhat considered to be inappropriate to use, right? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sure there are other things to discuss. So let's move that to the meetings. And again, let's thanks Ibrahim one more time.